Hello everybody, welcome to Alan Wall's Photography. This is Alan and today we're going to be taking control of specular highlights. In this video we're going to do three things. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about specular highlights, polarized light and how polarizing filters work. Then I'm going to show you how to build your own compact cross-polarization photographic lighting system. And third, we're going to run through a couple of examples and uh, take some photographs that are typically ruined by specular highlights and see if we can get rid of them. Before we begin, thank you to my Patreon supporters. Thank you also to the generous folks who've contributed uh, through making a donation on my website. Really do appreciate your help, guys. Thank you very much. If after watching this video, you decide you cannot live without your very own cross-polarization gadget, then you can go over to my website. The address is gonna be in the show notes. It's also right here. And there's an article there that will give you a cutting diagram and a parts list and everything you need to make your own cross-polarizers. And if you're trying to find out where you can get some of this stuff, check the show notes. You'll find some links in there that may be helpful. So specularity. Specular highlights are reflections of the light source that you're photographing. Now, much of the time in photography, these specular highlights are very useful. They're a very important component of the photograph. Take, for example, uh, a portrait. Any portrait worth its salt has got a nice catch light in the dominant eye. What is the catch light? That's a specular highlight. That's a reflection of the light source. Specular highlights are an incredibly important tool for our brains to know that what we're looking at is three-dimensional instead of flat. Sometimes that's also important in macro photography. A great example is shooting a compound lens at really high magnification. It might be hard for your brain to figure out that you're actually looking at individual round lenses that are grouped together, and it'll have a strange, unnatural flat look if you took out the specular highlights. So we don't always want to get rid of it, but sometimes we do. And uh, the example I'm going to be using today is water droplets on plant leaves or on uh, a flower's petals. When you're trying to capture the feeling of these mini reflections in the water droplets themselves, specular highlights just ruin that because they, they completely dominate the, uh, the water droplet. All you see is this bright streak from the reflected light source. I'm sure you're familiar with the term cross-polarization, but I'm going to take a minute to explain it anyway, just so we have the complete story. So what is a polarizing filter? There are two kinds. There are linear and circular polarizers. The circular polarizers are really pretty complicated and involve a second polarizing element. We're going to talk about them as if they were the same because we're going to be keeping this on a fairly shallow level. But a polarizing filter allows some light to pass unimpeded but it reflects some light back towards the source. Imagine, if you will, that this whole card is full of these, these slits. This is what a polarizing filter might look like. Now, it is going to block some of the light. That's why you always have to compensate with exposure when you put one of these on because it is blocking a proportion of the light rays that just happen to hit the reflective part instead of the gap, while the rest of it goes through the gap. Now, if you're using this on a scene that has no highly reflective surfaces, all of the light is coming back in a non-polarized form, then a portion say 80% of the, of the photons are gonna just get through the filter unchanged. But then say you had a beam of polarized light where all of the waves are in the same orientation. Now, if all of those waves are in the same orientation as the filter, 
then our polarized light can pass right through and your specular highlights will be just as they always are. However, if, if the polarized light is at a slightly different angle, it can't get through and it is rejected, so it doesn't get through the lens, it doesn't get to your sensor, and it doesn't show up. Remember that the rest of the light is getting through in the same proportion it always did. It doesn't care what orientation your polarizer is at. It's going to block some, it's going to let the rest through, and that's a, a constant. So this really only affects light that's polarized. So that solves our problem, right? If we're taking a picture of one of my flowers, then the light that is going to hit them from, say, our flash is going to be hitting them at slightly different angles, which means that the light that is reflected perfectly to form a specular highlight is going to be reflected at slightly different angles, which means if we use a polarizing filter, we have to decide which of the polarized light is the light we want to block. For example, as we turn our polarizing filter, we can maybe knock out some of those specular highlights, but now new ones appear because they're no longer blocked. The problem is that there are different angles of specularity that are showing up as hotspots in the photograph. Now, a polarizing filter works great when you have one huge source of polarized light, like the surface of a mill pond, a still body of water with the light hitting it at a specific angle and reflecting into your camera at the incident angle, the identical angle. So what you're seeing on your sensor is a perfect reflection of the sky, the light source off the water. Then, a polarizing filter is fantastic because if you turn it until it aligns with the polarity of the light that's bouncing off the water, all that light will disappear because you'll block it while letting all the rest of the light from different angles come through. So we have a problem. If we just use a flash, then we're going to have a lot of different specular highlights that are only going to respond partially to our filter. That's where cross polarization comes in. And that's how we can get rid of the highlights that we don't want. And the way we do it is to polarize all of the light striking the subject. Then we could use our polarizing filter to get rid of all of it. It's a lot easier with one, uh, one source of light to worry about, but you can also do it with two, which is my preference, so that you can have a key light and a fill light. The issue with using two is we have to tune these. We have to align their polarity. And I'm going to show you how to do that in just a second. But first, we need to build these. And it is so much fun. So let's do that now. This is the super cool device that we're going to be making to make this whole project a lot easier to pull off. It's very simple. It consists of a polarizing filter with a couple of uh, step up or step down rings just to thicken the, the mass of the uh, circular polarizer and uh, some foam material. It's very easy to make, just takes a few minutes and I'm going to show you how to do that now. I recommend building two of these and you'll see why in a minute. So the first thing we need are our raw materials. This is a piece of a floor tile. Uh, there's a link in the show notes to tell you where you can get this stuff. It's uh, dirt cheap, very light, very strong. You're also gonna need a sheet of thin foam. It's the same compressed EVA. I think it's called EVA as this. It's just, this is, you know, what, eight millimeters thick, and this is only about two millimeters thick. Uh, this stuff you can get at, at any craft shop. This you can get at any hardware store. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut the front and the rear support rings, and uh, we're gonna make a 
hole the shape of a flash in one end and a hole the shape of our filter in the other. Uh, this is going to be very specific for your flash and your filter. So uh, you have to have those things handy when you're doing this. All you need to do is, first of all, take your, take your filter and whatever rings you're going to attach to it to thicken this distance. I have two, a step up and a step down ring of the same size as my filter. Uh, place it on your, your mat and draw a circle around it, like so. And then what you want to do is take your compass and open it up a little bit more than the size of your filter. Now, the bigger you make it, the bulkier it'll be, but the more sturdy it will be. I found about a centimeter and a half to be ideal, a very comfortable size. Now, once I've made this line, I immediately make another one right next to it. In fact, if you can get them to almost touch, it'll make your job a little bit easier. So I make a second one here. Now, once I've made this, because this is really nothing more than a dent in the rubber, I'll take my marker and I use these Sharpie fine points and I'll go around and I'll fill in the groove so that the line is really easy to see. The next step is to cut out the template for the flash. And that just consists of taking the flash you're going to use and eyeballing it to get it positioned as close to the center as possible, like so, and then drawing a line around it. Well, I guess I could do that now. Now, both on the both on the circle for the filter, uh, for the uh, polarizer, and for the flash. If you point your tip in a little bit, like so, as you're tracing, it'll make the hole slightly smaller than, than we need, which is good, because if it's a bit smaller, it'll hold really well. Then take a, uh, a good quality, my absolute favorite is this new one I found. It's just a cheap craft knife, uh, but these blades are really sharp and they last a long time. And you are going to cut out the circle and then cut out the space for the filter. Do the same with the other and you're going to cut out the, the um, edge of the flash. And what you'll end up with is two rings like so. All right, now we need to connect these two rings uh, and they don't need a lot of space. They need more space than being right together just because it's easier if they're a little bit longer. So the way I want to do that is by taking our thin sheet of uh, foam and cutting two strips. One of them is going to be the full extension between the two rings, so it'll be this length. The other one, I want to be only the distance between the two rings. So what I did was, from my thin foam, I cut out a strip six centimeters wide. So with this, this is the uh, six centimeter wide strip, and I will double check that I have the length correct. I've already trimmed this one down. This one is about a, a centimeter narrower on each side. So I make this one about four centimeters wide. So what we're gonna do is attach the thin strip to the middle of the thick strip. And the reason for this is it to allow me to get a very sturdy connection between the rings and the, and the strip but also have the added uh, structural uh, security of this middle band, which just strengthens the, the tube part. Now we're going to attach it offset. And the reason for that is if we attached it in line, we would have to glue together the, e the edges of this. And you can do that, but it's a whole lot easier to offset it 
And then when we connect this, you can see that we have the smaller piece inside and you've got a big surface area of connection, like so. All right, for that to work, your inner strip needs to be about, about a centimeter shorter or a little less, maybe half a centimeter sh shorter than the big strip. Otherwise, when you uh, close the loop up, the inner strip will overlap a little bit and you don't want that. All right, so the next thing is uh, using uh, contact cement. This is the best contact cement in the world, this uh, DAP weld wood. I don't know if you they have it in your country, but uh, yeah, come to America and get some and then go home again because it's worth it. This stuff is magic for this kind of rubber. I like to apply it, by the way, with a, um, uh, I use these brushes to put um, rosin uh, or whatever that stuff is when I'm soldering things uh, to make the solder runny. These brushes are great for that and you buy them in like a box of a hundred, uh, but they're absolutely the bee's knees for painting cement onto things. adhesive to dry and be ready to use but let me remind you you need to you need to give it long enough to be visibly dry with no shiny liquid on it then what we're going to do is position the skinny piece on top of the big piece with a nice big overlap doesn't have to be exact close enough it will bond totally and instantly, even though it's dry. Now, the only tricky bit of this is what comes next. Uh, I recommend, you can do it any way you want, but I recommend putting the ugly part of the mat facing to the inside of the device. I pick a point near one end, I line up, remember this is gonna bond instantly. So I line up the edge of one of my rings and it'll stick just like that. And then I line up the edge of my other one right opposite, like so. Then what I do is very carefully keeping the, both edges in alignment, I roll the I roll the rings forward, checking from side to side as I go. it nice and firmly to make sure that everything is stuck together and when you are done this is what you have all we're trying to do here is give the tube more to grab onto yet leaving the CPL at, uh, at the front so that I can still adjust it uh, if you slide it in from the sides and just gently work it into the hole like this it will it will stay and it doesn't go anywhere believe me i mean it's it's in there solid the other piece of course goes on the other end line up the little bump in the template with the little bump on the top of your flash if you're using these godoxes which i recommend you do and that is it and we have a matching pair 
One absolutely crucial step is to align the polarity of my two filters. And the way we do that is to take an LCD. An LCD puts out polarized light. It's the, the way they work. They have polarizing filters behind the LCD layer and in front of it. Now you can see I have attached two little pointy markers uh, onto the ends of the, the tubes just so that I can have a point of reference. Now what I'm going to do is line up the filter with the LCD. So this is polarized light that's coming through it. And then by slowly turning the, the filter, it'll eventually get to the point where it's blocking all of that polarized light. I am going to mark my my uh, ring right there by the index mark so that I know that that's in the full polarized um, orientation. Then I'll do the same with the other one. Okay. And then I'll mark this one as well. So that when we set up the, the shot with the two flashes, I'll know that all I have to do is align the dot on the ring with the arrow on the, the top of the tube and they will be synchronized. I'm going to use these that I stole from my daughter, the little sparkly gems to do my marks. Before I start taking pictures, I've got one pro tip for you. Instead of spraying it with water, spray it with an equal parts mixture of warm water, corn syrup, clear corn syrup, and vegetable glycerin. And then thoroughly spray down your, your flour and the, the liquid will stay on there forever. You'll get these gorgeous big drops that just hang there. So let me go and prepare a flour, set up a little experimental shoot right here, and then we'll take some pictures and see what we get. So let me demonstrate to you what cross-polarization looks like. I have a single petal with three drops of water on it. It's illuminated by a single LED. Now, there's no filter on the LED, but there is a circular polarizing filter on the camera, which is why the specular highlights are not nearly as bad as they would be if I took the filter off. But they're still there. What I'm going to do now is put a circular polarizer in front of the light source. Now, I, the light that is hitting the, uh, the petal is polarized. I just don't know what orientation it's polarized in. Now, to get rid of the specular highlights, one of these filters has to be completely perpendicular to the other one in order to block this particular orientation of polarized light. So what I'm going to do is adjust the uh, polarizer on my lens, turning it counterclockwise until the specular highlights disappear. Now I know that the uh, filter on my lens is absolutely perpendicular to the filter on the light and none of the polarized light is getting through. And if you don't believe me, I just lift the filter out of the way and you can see that the specular highlights come right back. So the closer the filter gets to being parallel with the one on the camera, the brighter the specular highlights get because the more of that of that polarized light is getting through and the closer it gets towards 90 degrees, the less of the polarized light is getting through until we get to this point where it's perfectly perpendicular and none of the specular highlights are showing. That is what cross polarization is. So the first setup is dead simple. I'm going to have to turn off some of these studio lights in a second, but just to show you the way I have it set up, I'm using a crop frame. Uh, Nikon D7500 with an 85 millimeter macro lens. It's on a Z lifter thing, a tripod head uh, that holds the camera nice and still. I'm doing this outside of the cage so that you can see the whole setup. I've already treated the flower with my sticky plant drop mixture and I have got two lights. I'm going to use a key light with this um, 
uh, Godox V8600 uh, II. And then uh, I've got another Godox over here uh, to use as a fill. We'll start out with uh, about 130 second power from the uh, key and about 1 128th for the fill. I'm going to uh, shoot at 1 250th of a second, uh, which is the sync speed for this camera. And I'm going to see if I can get away with uh, shooting at f10. Let's see what we get here. Well, no problem with the specular highlights. We got a lot of them. Let me uh, let me turn off some of these lights. So the initial photographs show just what you would expect: a complete mess of overexposure and the uh, specular highlights. Uh, so this is the kind of photograph where you'd want to use this technique. Now, when I add the circular polarizing filter, there's quite a bit of improvement. And uh, you, can, you can start to make out the drops a lot more clearly, but they all still have some specularity in them. It's not nearly as off-putting as it was, but uh, I think with cross-polarization, we can improve on that. And here are some of the images with uh, the cross-polarization in effect. I must say I'm seeing a little bit more specularity than I would expect with cross-polarization. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, photograph a ball bearing instead and uh, see if I can figure out what's going on because a, a ball bearing is as unforgiving as any subject you can shoot. Uh, in the uh, initial photographs, as expected, you just have two large fiery balls of, of blown out highlight. With the circular polarizer, there's not a whole lot of difference, uh, a little bit of improvement there. But very interestingly, when I put on both of my flash polarizers, I can see there is a clear mismatch in the polarity of the light coming from both devices. You can see in this photograph that I have completely suppressed the specularity from the left-hand side flash yet I still have some specularity from the right flash. And uh, yeah, I had them out of alignment. I don't know how that happened. So what I did was I started changing the polarity of the light from the right flash going uh, counterclockwise in very, very small steps until I finally got to the point where the the uh, specularity was being suppressed on both sides. So finally, after a little fiddling around, I was able to set the polarity of both of my flashes and of the filter on my lens to where they were perfectly oriented or almost perfectly oriented. And you can see from these images, when you do that, all of the specularity is gone from your photograph. And that's the point of this discussion. Uh, it's not hard to do. It's fun to make the things. And uh, yeah, it works. It really does work. Well, there you have it. A fun and useful technique to have in the bag. Uh, if you need any help building your own gizmos, get in touch. If you need the cut list or the shopping list to go buy the stuff you need to make them, check out my website. I've also put some links in the show notes, which may help. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again in a few days. Until then, take care, be safe. Thank you.